All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this talk. Um, my name is Shannon Fleischman, and I am the curator at the Arizona Heritage Center, which is pictured behind me, which is where Thomas Fries Marcus is currently sitting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share a quick PowerPoint with you as an introduction. If I can get my screen share to work. Okay, can we all see that? That's great. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, on this panel, you'll see myself, um, Shannon Fleischman and the museum curator uh, behind the scenes, help, uh, scenes helping free set up is Mike Goodwin. He is our preparator. And then also on screen is Vanessa, who is our preparator down in Tucson. So if you have any questions, just look for one of our three faces, we'll be there for you. Um, just a little bit about us, just so you know, we're the Arizona Historical Society and we are Arizona's oldest historical agency. We have four locations spread across the state in Flagstaff, Tempe, Yuma, and Tucson. And we really go or strive to meet our mission, which is connecting people through the power of Arizona's history. And one of the ways that we do that is with um, local artists like Breeze tonight. And so we connect through, through different forms of history and we're trying to make sure that we diversify our museum as well to include different stories and make sure that we're telling a more well-rounded version of Arizona's history as we proceed. So let me go ahead. Um, one of the other things that we're doing is we are trying to uh, get a little more name recognition out there. And we developed this amazing license plate that pictures a monsoon. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get a whole lot of those this year, but has a, mo a monsoon background that you can actually get at the DMV. So go ahead and show your historical pride and put one on your car when you're ready to renew your license plate. And then um, just for reference right now, we have two locations that are open Tuesday through Saturday, uh, 10 to 2 p.m. We have the Arizona History Museum located in Tucson and the Arizona Heritage Center, which is located in Tempe, where Breeze's exhibition is up um, until March 31st of this year. And then some other exhibit highlights, we have Barry Goldwater, which is a super cool exhibit, which has his massive, massive desk uh, featured down in Tucson. And then we have an exhibit titled Still Marching from Suffrage to the hashtag Me Too movement, which looks at um, uh, protest movements focused around women's rights in Arizona. And that will be, both of those will be up through uh, 2021. And then just a heads up for upcoming virtual events. We have one next week, which is I'll take credit for that, a Mary Coulter presentation, which focuses on um, our Northern Arizona branch in Flagstaff. And then on February 3rd, we have a presentation where water is king and shadow is queen talking about water rights in Arizona. If you would like to participate in those, it's similar to what you did tonight. You fill out a registration form and you just go to azhs.org backslash calendar for all of our upcoming events. And last but not least, um, we do have memberships and as a member, members get the best deal in history. So you not only get a free entry into all of our museums, but you get also get a 10% discount at all of the gift shops. And then you get the subscription for the Journal of Arizona History. And just so you know, we recently put out a double issue uh, for the Journal of Arizona History, which is a spectacular issue. Um, you don't wanna miss that. So members get that for free. And if you, um, if you join, you also get all of the back issues. So you don't have to feel like you missed out on one. So you can join at azhs.org. That is the slide that I was just a little ahead on. Okay. So now I'm gonna give the floor to our esteemed guest, Mr. Thomas Breeze Marcus to talk about his exhibit, Current State. 
Okay, I can figure out how to stop sharing. There we go. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Shannon. And thanks to uh, the Arizona Historical Society and the Arizona Heritage Center. Um, thanks for everybody for, for joining in. My name is uh, Thomas Breeze Marcus. This is my second uh, talk out of this museum, although this one is specifically for the museum. The first one I did was for uh, an organization out of Kansas City back in September who was curious about uh, some issues on the uh, Thorn Autumn Nation down in Southern Arizona where I'm originally from. Uh, well, where my people are from, where my mother was born and raised and where my bloodline is. Um, so this is sort of a, I don't know if it's a continuation, but maybe a, a revised version of that talk. And I'm going to discuss a little bit about my exhibit here and the body of work that I have up in the museum. Uh, and if you have a chance, you still have time to come see it, down and see it uh, with the adjusted museum hours. And uh, yeah, so thanks again. And big shout out to uh, Mike G, uh, who is here. Those of you who are watching and may know him, uh, Mike Goodwin, and also if they're watching, Ken Richardson and Amy Young from the uh, Travis Gallery in downtown Phoenix, which is unfortunately unfortunately no longer, but was a staple in the downtown Phoenix art scene over a decade ago, uh, as well as Perhelion Arts. So thank you guys for always uh, creating a platform for us, us downtown artists and uh, artists of different backgrounds and, and, and really uh, putting the spotlight on us. So thanks Mike G. And, um, and an unrelated big shout out to uh, my good friend, uh, Vial One, V Y A L, Vial One from LA. He's here in Phoenix right now, uh, painting a small project uh, down near 16th Street. And uh, Vial is an incredible mural artist. He actually gave me the shirt that I'm wearing tonight. I rarely wear a shirt with print on it. I just wanted to acknowledge him real quick. And for those of you that are that can't really read it or are curious about to what it says, uh, it says Rocker Food. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it, but I'll say real quick, for, for those that don't know or are unfamiliar with the, uh, the dialects of East LA and, and, and hood culture, uh, we, uh, there's a, a term that, they, that a lot of uh, people use and it's foo, and it's, it's basically foo, F-O-L-L, shortened to F-O-O, and it's kind of like saying, hey man, or hey dude, or hey bro, you know, but uh, back in the, I think in the early days, like in the 80s or so, with so many uh, metal heads running around East LA that were Chicano and other backgrounds, I think a lot of the, a lot of the Chicano cholos and gang members didn't know what to make of these dudes with long hair and all dressed in black and got that or punk. And so they would be like, hey, are you a, are you a rocker fool? So represent rocker fool and uh, shout out to Vile. But uh, anyways, uh, back to the talk. I'm gonna try and break this down into a couple different sections. Uh, and I wanna start with, uh, you, you know, this is a historical museum. I wanna start off a little bit about our, our perspective as indigenous people, myself and my background coming from the Akimur Atham and the Thon Atham uh, nations here, who are the original tribes of the desert area here. Uh, for many that may not know that, uh, I find that interesting that there are a lot of people that don't know who the original native tribes were here in the Valley of Phoenix and south, south of the valley in the, uh, the desert areas. A lot of people are familiar with uh, Navajo or Apache, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about that um, as well as my own personal artist journey and career where I've uh, come from, what has inspired me and allowed me to create and develop this, this style that I've created for myself, but also the importance of the work and what uh, I choose to talk about in some of these pieces that I'll share with you later. Uh, but I, uh, I really, um, let's see what's happening here. But uh, so I'll, I'll get into a little bit of that. And then at the very end, I may or may not, uh, I may or may not uh, get into uh, some of the, uh, uh, current happenings with the downtown Phoenix mural scene, if we have time, which is something that I've been wanting to talk about for quite a while, um, along with some other artists, who, uh, those of us who've been involved with these uh, murals for a very long time, over a couple decade, couple decades. 
uh, in some cases. But uh, so yeah, I I uh, want to start by um, let's start with Arizona. You know, the word Arizona. A lot of people don't know where the the origins of the word Arizona come from. Um, I think I've heard some people who thought maybe it was a, a Spanish for arid zone, like a dry, dry desert area, but uh, that's not the case. The word Arizona comes from the native language of the Otho people, and uh, it's actually Arishon. And Arishon means, Ari means baby or small or little, describing something that's small or young or, or, or tiny in size. But uh, shown can mean a few different things, like uh, the base of a mountain or foothills, and or describes a, a spring, like a, a spring of water. So Areshon was describing a place, which is actually a real place outside of Nogales. I think it was southwest of Nogales. And it was a place that the Otham had called Areshon. And those that aren't familiar, our, our original homelands, the Otham and Otham, the Otham stretched from here in the valley to uh, Northern Sonora down to almost uh, Hermosillo. So the word Arishon became Arizona along with a lot of other words that people may not know, like Tucson is actually uh, Tucson, which means uh, the dark foothills or the, the black foothills. Uh, just a little bit of in interesting information that I think is worth sharing that people may not know. Uh, so in discussing that, uh, let me pull some photos real quick here. with me a second I had to do this last time uh, and thanks for joining in in the virtual world that we're in I hope everybody is safe uh, and uh, COVID free and if you are going through that right now I hope you pull through and get better ASAP um, I know it's been hard man I've, I've had family members who've been sick my uh, my stepdad's uh, cousin recently passed away you know I, I consider him an uncle he passed away from COVID so uh, Anybody that's going through that, you know, obviously we're all affected by that. So just trying to do the best that we can here. Um, all right, let me start with this. Oh, no. Let's see if this works. So this is a piece, uh, I guess I gotta show this later. This is actually here in the exhibit, uh, talking about the, the, the uh, homelands uh, of the autumn. Uh, I don't know if you can really see this, but uh, this was actually even made by Mike G who's here in the museum. Uh, and it shows some of the traditional homelands in the gray. And for those that, that are, aren't familiar that the, the Autumn tribe, we are also, we consider ourselves the descendants of the uh, Hohokam culture that uh, many may be uh, familiar with. Uh, in our language, it's actually pronounced Hohokam. Hohokam uh, is describing people who've gone on who aren't here anymore and uh, we consider ourselves the same people and just descendants of, but anyhow, in this picture here, you can see that uh, our, our homelands did stretch as far as it did and in, in the sort of darker brownish maroon areas are, are where the current reservations are today. Um, let's see here, sorry. I'm not sure if this is working the same way as last time. And, uh, one of the uh, important parts of that history for me is being inspired by a lot of the older art, but also my own uh, experience as a, as a graffiti artist or a graffiti writer here in Phoenix. A lot, of, a lot of my inspiration comes from typography and the background of uh, just the intensity in, and uh, being involved in, in that, that medium, in that subculture. And I think a lot of newer artists, uh, new to public art and mural art may not necessarily know, which is probably a good thing. I don't think a lot of people wanna know what that life was like. Is it, it pretty pretty rough back in the day and to, you know, took a toll on a lot of us that went through it. Uh, I mean, you're basically you know, creating illegal, or I should say unsanctioned work and risking your life and your freedom for for a lot of uh, different reasons, personal reasons, and, and, and just wanting to be uh, heard and having a voice relevant and letting uh, 
the, the system know that, uh, you know, everybody's different, everybody has a different experience, but I think one thing that I also uh, kind of stick to in remembering that it was uh, a movement create, created out of a failed system. Those, especially those back in the late 70s, early 70s of New York and painting the subway cars, um, you know, it was a uh, sort of birth out of that as well as hip hop, hip hop culture and not just hip hop culture, but punk, you know, the music and uh, a lot of different things. So very uh, tribal art form is born out of resistance. And uh, that's something that's very near and dear to me. And I'll always be uh, 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 thankful for those experiences, but I've also taken it, I've also taken it uh, as a learning, uh, curve and part of my own development and growing into the future as well. Um, so that's a little bit about my my uh, graffiti background before transitioning into uh, murals, which I'll get into a little later. Um, let's see here. One second. Uh, let me pull some of these up. Sorry, it takes a little bit of a time. Uh, since we're talking about, you know, adversity, and I, I feel like that's a big inspiration in, in some of the work that I do, and, and triumph, uh, triumph out of struggle, right? You know, there, there's a lot of historical things that happened that we all know uh, what happened to the indigenous people here in our histories. I don't need to get into that and how we ended up where we are and, and everything. Um, and we have survived time and time again, countless uh, adversity. And, and here in 2021, that's kind of crazy to say, 2021, we're still facing issues like that. Uh, specifically, uh, I'm thinking about the uh, issues on the Don't Autumn Nation down in Southern Arizona. If you're not familiar where the Don't Autumn Nation is, it's south of Casa Grande, uh, west of Tucson, and uh, east of Ajo and basically north of the uh, international border. Uh, like I was saying earlier, it's where my mother was born. Uh, I myself have never lived down there, but I grew up here in the city of Phoenix as well as the Salt River, uh, Pima Maricopa community, which is also an Autumn community. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the title of the show, you know, and I'll, I'll, at the end, I'll, pan around and show some of the pieces that are in here. The title of the show in here is called Current State. And it's a, it's a mixed body of work, but uh, I felt like it came together uh, really well and shows a, a, a broad range. But uh, what I was thinking about, uh, especially, especially with some of the pieces I have in here, current state, like what are the current state, what's the current state of, of indigenous people in Arizona? What's the current state of my own people and in, in, in our communities. And uh, one of the things that I know noticed that does not get out into mainstream media so much is the uh, heightened level of militarization down on the on the uh, Don Otham Reservation. And um, if you haven't been down there, uh, it, let's see, hang on a second. If you haven't been down there, it's kind of an eye-opening experience for someone who, who hasn't gone and to see the uh, border checkpoints to get in and out of the reservation. I'm not talking about checkpoints to go into Mexico and back into Arizona. I'm talking about to get into the native community of the Thonoth Nation and this is a perfect example. This is one of those Homeland Security Border Patrol checkpoints. These popped up uh, right after 9-11. So we're around 20 years now, almost 20 years um, that these checkpoints have been put up down on the Thunautham Nation. And every outfit you can think of is down there associated with Homeland Security beds, you know, different things like that. And of course, uh, I'm sure you got your other groups who are not part of Homeland Security who just want to chase down some immigrants because whatever, they have a 
the wrong idea about uh, people. Anyhow, this right here, I took this photo myself. Uh, this is leaving the, the Haunted Nation. Um, and what I always make sure to tell people is, yes, I am from here, but I've never lived down here. Like this is where my roots are. So I, in that way, I have that privilege that I don't experience this every day. However, everybody down there who has to come and go out of the reservation, whether it's to go into Tucson or come to Casa Grande or Phoenix, that need to get supplies or go to the grocery store if they can't, if their grocery store, the once one grocery store down in sells doesn't, doesn't have it. They need to go through these checkpoints and to leave, they get stopped and asked if they are citizens of the United States every single day. And sometimes it's as easy as just a wave and wave them through. Sometimes it's a question like that. Other times it's it's harassment for whatever reason. Um, I, I only know so much and I also need to say that too. There are plenty of other people down there, friends of mine and other people that I know that have been involved with various organizations and groups for years uh, involved with trying to take some sort of action to protect the people because in a lot of ways they don't feel protected with this. They feel like they're cattle and they're under watch because they are under constant surveillance and, and there aren't just border patrol checkpoints. If you drive on this highway down to cells, you're gonna see 90% border patrol vehicles, you're gonna see air patrols, you're going to see uh, just a little bit of everything. One of the latest uh, developments that's happened in the last year down there is there is a company, an Israeli-based defense company that has built and tested on Palestinian people in Palestine. Uh, they built these surveillance towers and the Homeland Security of the United States government and don't them travel leaders for whatever reason came to this agreement and put these towers throughout the, the reservation down there, um, tracking everybody's movement. And it's just, it just has to make you wonder. Uh, I, it's very complicated down there. I don't have all the answers. And again, I don't know everything. If you want to find out more information, and it's very hard to find sometimes, but if you want to find more information, I would suggest to Google as simple as Google or YouTube, don't know the nation border issues. You know, Vice, I think, has done a couple pieces on, on it. But it's very hard to find some of that information in the bigger mainstream media. Um, so these these things that are happening, they're they're very complicated because um, because of cartel activity on the other side or migrants coming across. You know, I have a, I actually have a really good family friend that I've known since I was small, who funny enough, he works for Homeland Security down there. He's from the reservation down there. He uh, chose to go into the military and get off the reservation at a young age, made a career out of it, came back and became a, uh, uh, an agent down there and is now kind of a higher up. Uh, at one point he was telling me, this was four years ago back when uh, the current administration was just coming in that just left yesterday. Um, he was, my, my family friend was telling my mother and I that, that a lot of, uh, the talk back then who, from who I will not even name, uh, was calling, you know, Mexicans, all sorts of Mexican immigrants, Mexican migrants, all types of different names and using it for whatever kind of political gain and to get people on board with his own personal agenda or bigger agenda. And the one thing that uh, that that friend of ours had said, and he, he was saying, well, there's not a whole lot of activity and he can't say so much. He can't really touch on it a whole lot, but he basically said that, well, we don't really even, we're not even on drug running detail anymore because there's not a lot of that through the reservation um, but what you do find here and there are people being uh, driven across, not walking through the desert. And when they do find those vans trying to go through 
you know, some back back roads, uh, back highways or major highways, he was saying that, you know, 90% of the people that they do end up finding, they're not even from a Spanish speaking country south of us, they're from overseas. Uh, so it's very, very complicated and it's a very, makes me feel not uncomfortable, but it's interesting to have that conversation with him because it's, I'm not saying he's on the other side of things and he kind of is in a way, but back to my point though, these issues are very complicated that are happening down there. But regardless, the native people, the Dona Adam are stuck right in the middle, stuck with these checkpoints and being harassed and being under 24 seven surveillance. Um, you know, I know there's talk of, of that and concern of that in, in different ways in, 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 in mainstream culture of all oh, surveillance and your, your, your devices are listening to you, your, <laughs> the algorithms and the way our information is sold. Yeah, you know what? But that's true. But I can't imagine what it's like to experience it the way that my own people down there, our own homeless people down there have to deal with that every single day. Uh, and I don't want to make this sound like it's dire straits down there, you know, like they they don't have any other alternative because there's a lot of amazing things happening with community organizing and, and just moving forward is the best that they can with the culture, the, the Himadak, and trying to maintain that way of life regardless. Because uh, I think it's safe to say that all of them feel that deep connection to this, this desert, you know. Um, I forgot I had photos, so I'm going to keep scanning here. Uh, we have this deep connection, you know, to, the, to this desert here, and it's a very uh, 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 harsh place to live, but our people have figured it out over centuries of living here and uh, have utilized it to its, its full potential and, and learned from it. And having that connection, you know, that, that old saying that a lot of, we hear from a lot of native cultures is having that relationship with Mother Earth. Uh, this is another photo. This is right near the, the international border. The border is like right behind it. That's looking at Baba Kiver Peak. And that is, a, and that's not one of the Israeli towers, but that's one of Border Patrol's uh, little uh, surveillance stations. This is the San Miguel gate down, just this is basically that photo you just saw, that little camera setup is just to the left of it. Um, that dirt road, that's, you know, there's tons of border patrol on there. Um, on the left side, that's the United States, on the right side is, is Mexico. Um, yeah, as you can see on your right in this photo, you can see that uh, border patrol van just sitting behind that tree, hanging out probably eating a blowing sandwich or something, watching Netflix. But uh, yeah, this is uh, just a little little look into uh, what's happening down there. Uh, and with that being said, that's what I really wanted to touch on uh, first. And uh, obviously with administrations, things just changed yesterday, like I said earlier. Uh, I think as native people, uh, and I, sh I shouldn't say I even speak for all Native people or even all, all of them at all, but I think we have a little bit more skepticism when it comes to who's in charge uh, as, as the history you know, has played out. And, I'll be, uh, and I'm not gonna sit here and try and knock the, the, the current administration that just went in. I mean, it's only been 24 hours. However, just to give a little bit of insight and perspective, I think native people are a little skeptical and hesitant to trust an old white guy in power. No, it's a fact. I think, at least for me, I should say that for me, I feel like, I feel that is uh, something that, uh, yeah, you know, they, it, with this last administration, if you weren't aware, further down, this is looking west, Further from here, maybe, I don't know what that would be, 50 miles south of Ajo down there, that, that, that wall that was being built that the other guys were supposed to pay for, uh, that's already falling apart. Uh, in order to that be built, there's a lot of that desert way past that mountain that you see in this photo that was a year ago in February was being desecrated and blown apart uh, to build this fence. And in that happening, 
with these being traditional homelands for the Altam and not just here with other indigenous people along the way, a lot of uh, things were disturbed. The natural ecosystem was disturbed, uh, dis destroyed basically. Um, down near Ajo, there was a natural spring that, that uh, a lot of groups, uh, Altam groups were really fighting to protect because it was uh, really creeping in close. And uh, the uh, construction company that was building that fence was basically draining that, that natural uh, pond in the middle of the desert, which is really rare. rare. They were draining that pond to use the water for cement to build uh, for the base of the uh, fence, if I remember that correctly. And on top of that, there was uh, sacred sites and burials that were, I mean, it sounds like it's straight out of a movie, but it's real life. Sacred sites and burial grounds that were destroyed and blasted through to uh, build this ridiculous fence. Uh, not this fence that you see here, but the other ones that you probably seen in the news for the last four years. So anyhow, uh, I'm gonna try moving this along a little bit. So anyways, now that you've gotten a little bit of insight and information about what it's like down there, you know, I think there's a couple of Instagram pages that you can follow and find down there. Um, find, find on Instagram, I think one is the uh, Defend Autumn Juliet, uh, Autumn uh, oh, D. D E F E N D O apostrophe O D H A M Jewed uh, G U W E D. Um, that's a good one to follow. There's a couple others, like I think one is Autumn Podcaster on Instagram. So there's other alternatives to find that media and to find out what's happening down there and to, to follow people that are actually on the front lines. And a big respect to those people that are down there. Um, so many to name, I can't name all of them, but just know that, that I recognize you. And uh, I want everybody to know the work that they've put into. Uh, onto the artwork. So as I was saying, a lot of my artwork does come out of uh, and is inspired by adversity. You know, I just graffiti alone, what I was saying earlier. This piece here, this is a canvas piece that I created back in uh, 2019, I believe. Uh, this piece is called Homeland Obscurity, Homeland Obscurity. And this uh, has a uh, squash blossom basket, autumn basket in the middle with uh, some hakimura or butterflies uh, trying to break through that. And to me, it felt like what we were just talking about like our, our Himadoc, our way of life being disrupted, uh, the land being destroyed, uh, and, and, you know, migrants too, trying to come across and risking their lives in that way. And a lot of people who die on the, on the way. Um, that's what this piece uh, is about, uh, clearly with the bar, barbed wire in the middle. Um, this is another piece that sort of made me, uh, think about a lot of those same issues. Um, you know, this one is uh, obviously dragonflies with, uh, with a basket in the middle, uh, I believe a whirlwind basket with coyote tracks. There's little four squares that are coyote tracks that are used in traditional optimum design and basketry. Um, keep going through. Uh, this piece, uh, I think I made about a year ago called uh, Picket Fence, Picket Fence Dreaming, uh, painted in red, white, and blue on purpose with a autumn uh, Hakimoto or butterfly basket behind the fence. This one really made me think about uh, the, the, the uh, stories that you would see on the media about uh, migrant children being ripped apart from their parents and thrown in cages, as well as the parents too, but separated and put into these cages. Um, which by the way, again, I'm not trying to knock the dude. I know he's only been in for 24 hours, but you know, that's, that's an important issue that needs to be corrected. You know, that totally inhumane, I won't even get into it, but I, wouldn't, I can't even imagine a child in my family being put in a cage, kept in a cage. But anyhow, that's uh, this piece. Uh, Another one that made me think of that too, and, and these are sort of dual meaning, right? You know, it reminds me of the issues that, and how the people feel down there on the Don't Autumn Nation and how they feel uh, the way they do and being under constant 
surveillance in, in a militarized zone, pretty much, but also uh, those migrants too, who are being treated in the way that they are. Uh, this piece, this piece is called um, "History on Repeat." History on repeat, and it, it made me think of everything from what's happening in Palestine to, if you're familiar with what's happening with North Korea, it has been happening in North Korea forever and or even the past, like uh, the Holocaust and things like that. Uh, so it's an interesting piece for me. I feel it says a lot. And, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. There's always some sort of issue to, 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 to talk about and, and things that aren't, that clearly are not put out there and, and addressed or taken care of or solutions. And, you know, again, I know, I, I know they can be complicated, but there's gotta be a way uh, to, to go about it in a better, uh, moving moving forward in a better way. Let's see, 638. Okay. Uh, these are more current pieces. This one is real current, actually. This is maybe a couple of months old. Um, again, the fence, uh, pretty clear, I think, to what's happening here. More barbed wire, uh, basket in the middle. And uh, the, the, the script in the middle, it says, Autumn uh, Himdok or Himdok. Himadak or Himdak in our language is the way of life. It's our, it's our, everything that makes us who we are and our connection. It, it, it's, a, it's very important to us in our survival and, and connection with the land, uh, like I was saying earlier. And to me, I wanted to express that, how it is being disrupted. And this was one of those pieces, a part of a more recent series. And by the way, these pieces are not up in this show right now. These are just pieces that I wanted to show. Uh, here's another piece, uh, a little different from what I normally would do. I included a landscape. Uh, I don't normally include a lot of landscapes, but I actually like painting landscapes. Uh, shout out to Ed Mel. I'm not nearly on his level, but great guy, great artist. Uh, but uh, in this one, you can see, uh, again, uh, some of the writing in the background in the textured uh, part of the painting. Uh, you know, it, it says a uh, desecration, militarization, harassment, checkpoints, surveillance. You know, and then it says uh, Thorn and Yachet. Uh, I didn't mention that earlier. There, there, are, there are multiple Atom groups. There are the Akimura Atom, the Thorn Atom, uh, and the Hyacha, the Hyacha Atom live closer to, to Yuma. Uh, so there's there's more than one group of, of Atom. Um, uh, onto this piece, this is a, a digital piece that I created uh, in response to kind of what, kind of, kind of goes in line with everything I just shared. Uh, this is a uh, historical photo of a Don Atom woman Obviously, my work in the background down below it says protect Autumn. Uh, this one is with a V, so there's variations in the dialect you know, from north to south. In the north, uh, they say it's sort of a V sound. In the south, it's with a, a W. Um, so even though she's a Thona Autumn woman, historically in the photo from the south, uh, I used the V in the Jewel. Mainly because I am both, and I relate with both because I did grow up in the north, but I have relatives, family, and friends down south. Uh, another design that I had created uh, digitally. It's a Baba Kibi Peak, like the photo you saw way earlier with the uh, surveillance tower, but uh, this one was uh, made into a T-shirt that I had sold on my uh, my merchandise website and donated funds to. Uh, different causes down there and different groups, independent groups down there near the border. Uh, this was done in uh, Procreate, if, if you were wondering if anybody uh, is familiar with Procreate. And uh, another digital, it's something I've gotten into recently, a lot of digital work uh, using Procreate on an iPad. Uh, but this was, uh, this one I think I made somewhere around the time of George Floyd back in June and uh, 
just made me think of you know other people as well, other groups of people and cultures within this country that have their adversities that they have to go through, and it's it's not easy. And uh, it, I think a lot of people of color and indigenous people and other people's background do understand each other in that way where we go through these things, but uh, I think it's, I think it's important to let others know that, that we need to, like it says at the bottom, if you can't read it, to continue to move forward in the face of adversity, persist. Uh, protect Atam Jewel, this one with a W, that was part of that shirt. Uh, this is a photo that I took on the border, uh, part of the uh, other uh, earlier photos that I took. This is a uh, San Miguel Gate down on the U.S. side of the Donatham Nation. Uh, that's my good friend Dwayne Manuel. Shout out to Dwayne if you're watching. Uh, he's from the Salt River community. He himself is a, a an Autumn artist, contemporary Autumn artist, incredible, incredible painter, muralist, and that's uh, Chinupo Hanska Luger also a contemporary native artist. Uh, the three of us are working on a project and we'll be uh, installing a, a, a piece at the Mesa Art Center here, uh, I believe in May. It was supposed to go up last May, but as the world came to what it is now, it got delayed for obvious reasons, but uh, that's, uh, that was an inter interesting moment right there. Just all of us looking you know, at the, wondering what's coming. I think, you know, that's the feeling I get when I see this. But uh, anyhow, that's, oops, that's not what I want to do. I do not want to leave the meeting. That's uh, that group of photos. And uh, that's a little bit about you know, what's happening down there. And again, uh, if you want more information, you can find it. And it's not going to be obviously on CNN or, or Fox News or anything like that. But uh, you can dig if you really want to know more. And again, I'm not, I'm not an expert. I'm not living down there, but at the very least, I know what I see and what I hear and, and, and from other people. And I just want to be able to use my own platform as a, as an artist to share that information, to share something that's uh, important to me. Uh, so I think. We only have 15 minutes, but uh, I'm gonna switch it up a little bit here and go to some of my murals because I know um, I made a post about possibly talking about some mural work here and then I'll sort of try and wrap it up. Cause, uh, these things go by quick, man. I, uh, you know, I don't think it does, but it does, especially just uh, have a lot to, to on your mind and, and a lot to talk about. And I feel like uh, that that's what I try to stick to is what I know and it just sort of comes out. But um, yeah, so I wanted to, to show a little bit of my mural work and try and touch on uh, the, the state of murals in downtown Phoenix and Phoenix in general and in Arizona. Uh, I really find it important that culturally based murals murals by indigenous artists, native artists, autumn artists, uh, Chicano artists, Mexican artists, uh, people of just all different backgrounds, you know, the black experience, the trans and queer experience, the, these, there's a lot of these artists that are, that are currently using that platform of creating large scale work uh, to share their their, their artwork with, with the rest of the community. And I think it's important to have that inclusion uh, because of how popular murals have become and because things have really changed in the dynamic of uh, how it's used as a marketing tool now. If you're, we, you know, you might be familiar with Roosevelt down on Roosevelt Road down in downtown Phoenix, how that's changed over the years, how uh, things, you know, properties have gotten bought out, rents have gone up, gentrification has happened, people have come and gone. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the landscape has changed 
but you know, the artist's voice, I think, is still very relevant. But like I was saying, it changes, unfortunately, with money. With that, you would have, I think, if you're an artist and you're, you are getting into mural painting, you have to be very aware that there are people out there that want to take advantage of you. you know, that it's just a fact. There are people that want to use you and sort of exploit you in a way and um, really, uh, and you know what, and, it's, and not just people that are you know, looking to use that in that way, but there are also people who, I don't even know if I would consider artists, I, I think I would consider them opportunists that jump on that bandwagon and start calling themselves that and start taking work from other people who really deserve it. And, and in some ways they're doing it out of greed and or other very harmful behaviors. You know, we've seen that happen in our community downtown in the last year, unfortunately. And, um, you know, I, back to what I was saying earlier, I think it's important that, that you have these people that really have uh, have uh, the talent, but also the voice, you know, the voices need to be heard with the uh, pieces that they're creating. Uh, the pieces that I choose to create uh, recently, and, and, and I guess in past years too, but the pieces that I'm choosing to create, like this one here, this is a brand new one, uh, as far as uh, new, I guess I should say, it was painted on, in October with the help of my good friend Pablo Luna uh, as an assistant. Uh, this piece is in South Phoenix. Uh, this piece is a is called is about um, the coyote in our autumn culture and our autumn uh, stories. And uh, uh, traditionally, the autumn stories and creation stories are told in the winter time. And I guess it depends on who you ask. Sometimes they're told on the coldest nights, and sometimes somebody might say, "Oh, they're told closer to like the uh, the solstice." So I won't tell the story a whole lot, just out of respect, but this piece was created out of uh, inspiration from the story of how South Mountain in South Phoenix that we're all probably familiar with got its name. Uh, in our language, it translates to Greasy Mountain. And there's a story, and there's, a vi there's variations of that story, but there, there's a story here that, uh, that after the rattlesnake had uh, received its, its fangs from it's fangs, venom, and rattle in a bit a jackrabbit, and the jackrabbit died. So the people decided to to uh, cremate the uh, the burning body, and the coyote ran off with the rabbit's heart and shipped the grease onto the mountain. Uh, I felt like this was a, an important piece to create in South Phoenix because it's close to the South Mountain. But I also feel when I'm making these pieces that they're important to have those stories, to have representation of cultural identity within the city, because within the city of Phoenix, you rarely see our culture represented. You rarely see uh, something that is autumn based. Uh, maybe you can say you see the freeways with the uh, Hohokam replica uh, designs and pottery. Well, I don't even think was designed by a, an autumn person back when they built those freeways in the 90s or 80s. But uh, I say that to say this, uh, I know a lot of people from my community in Salt River, Gila River, and Don Autumn Nation, when they come to the city, when they leave the reservation, when they leave their community where they're at, they come to the city, they don't necessarily feel at home or welcome. And I kind of think that's partly because you don't see us in our own homelands represented within the inner city. So to me, to put this up, to create that identity, uh, is extremely important so those people can see themselves when they do come in the city. You know, they can see themselves represented and, and understand that they are home, regardless of how they may feel in a certain part of town. That we, when they see the South Mountain or Camelback Mountain or Patmore Buttes, you know, that's home and that's the same landscape that our ancestors have looked at, you know, for for centuries. Uh, there's another piece. This uh, is a roadrunner. Uh, also based on a, on a creation story. I won't go too long on these since uh, time's already really going fast. Uh, this was one of my, also also a very recent piece. This was a collaboration with my good friend Vile, uh, who I mentioned earlier at the beginning here with the, my rocker food shirt on. 
Uh, this is an abandoned hotel up in Gray Mountain, Arizona, 40 miles north of uh, Flagstaff. Uh, Viola and I created this piece. Uh, it's right at the border of the Navajo Nation, actually. We're about a, this was a mile, just a mile south of the, the reservation border. But uh, a friend of ours, Jarrell Singer, uh, made a contribution to this piece, and he grew up near there. Um, it was really important for us to, to transform this abandoned uh, place into a work of art. And I can't tell you how many people stopped and were so thankful that we were doing this, uh, that, that were glad to see it not just falling apart and being scribbled on by random stuff. Uh, and uh, they couldn't thank us, thank, thank us enough to do this. And uh, shout out to Chip Thomas, uh, Dr. Chip Thomas from the Navajo Nation, who has a project called uh, the Painted Desert Project. You can look that up probably on YouTube. Uh, Painted Desert Project. There's a lot of mural art projects that he's curated up there with different people from different backgrounds. Uh, but I felt like it was. Uh, good to have that connection to connect with the community so they could feel some sort of inspiration and, and, and to see some life come to this, especially in the time that we're in with lockdowns and COVID, and especially the Navajo Nation who got hit hard. Uh, and uh, it was an honor to paint this and I was uh, happy to create it with my friend Vile and Jarrell, uh, Douglas Miles, who also uh, joined in later and, and and contribute to a, another part of the wall that you can't really see. Um, let's see how many we got here. I'll try and go through this real quick. Uh, another piece. This is uh, always I painted this piece in mind with with uh, the creation story of the rattlesnake and how it got its fangs and venom and rattle in mind. And this piece is on the uh, Tempe uh, New School for the Arts in Tempe. Thank you, uh, Keelan, uh, for making this happen. Uh, this is another school. This is in the Hamburg neighborhood in West Phoenix, like 27th Avenue Indian School. Um, Granada Middle School, I believe it's called. And this is the same one. Uh, anyways, I'll, I'll leave it on this. Um, I'll leave it on this photo. As I was saying, you know, it's, it's already almost been an hour. Well, it's been like 50 minutes maybe, but uh, I feel with the, that platform of public art and, and murals specifically, it's important to really have, and again, this is just my thoughts, this is just my perspective, it doesn't mean I'm right, but I think it is important to have some substance and to really have a deeper conversation about things that are happening. You know, we saw a lot of that happen during the, uh, the protest back in June and the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and, uh, everything else, I uh, saw a lot of people uh, out there to, uh, addressing those issues, you know, a few artists I can think of to mind, whether it was even a mural and or just artwork in general, uh, great artists, downtown artists like uh, Ashley Macias, uh, uh, Justin, who has like just created it on Instagram, uh, Clyde, Nyla Lee, Antoinette Cawley, all these amazing artists that are down there using their voice and their platform Again, and this is something that uh, I was leading to earlier, to talk about something, to utilize our ability to make art and our platform to discuss things bigger than ourselves. It's not just about us, it's something bigger than ourselves. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I love seeing those happen. And I you know, understand that that's a complicated thing too. Maybe a part of me feels a little I can say that, you know, that it makes me feel a little uh, jaded on some topics surrounding public art and murals because I feel like I've been around so long. So therefore I sound like the old guy griping now, now, now that I'm in that position where 20 years ago it was the young guy just, uh, you know, tagging on walls and trains. <laughs> how, things, how things change, I guess, uh, as we grow older. But uh, anyways, uh, Man, I could talk for a whole nother hour, but I, I won't do that to you guys. Uh, I definitely want to show and pan around some of these pieces as uh, quickly as I can and uh, try and get a few questions if there are questions. I posted on Instagram earlier 
uh, if anybody had questions, they could try and ask me and I would do my best to try and uh, answer them. But um, yeah, thank you guys for joining in. And I'm gonna stop this share here and pick up my iPad, pan around the exhibit hall here. And if you do have a couple questions, I, I don't know how we're gonna work that here uh, through this, this platform on Zoom, uh, we can try and do that too. So let me see if I can get this turned around here. Um, sorry, technology is smarter than I am. But, uh, oh, here we go. Oh, come on, man. Oops. <laughs> see here oops sorry because i want to see the floor anyways uh here i'll take you guys to the front this is the inside of the museum here this is uh, the arizona heritage center and um this is my exhibit current state this awesome little intro piece right here was also made by mike g the man is a wizard and a great artist thanks mike for that and uh you know, I opted for this too. Uh, uh, they have some traditional baskets here in the uh, museum collections. That's one of the, I didn't, I don't know if I mentioned that earlier, but that's one of my biggest inspirations other than my own experience as a graffiti artist uh, is my own traditional artwork that comes from my uh, cultures and my people. Just the intricacy and the designs, you know, really, really helped me uh, push and develop my own style. There's that piece I shared earlier Try and get a zoom up on that. Phoenix, Salt River Hill over Tucson. Some materials. These are uh, some traditional rattle, rattles that I had made. And uh, if you can see the detail on them. Gore rattles. This is the canvas piece. This piece is uh, 2016. It's titled uh, Life Interrupted. Life Interrupted. To me, this was uh, also, I think when I was creating this, it was making me think of uh, borders and border walls and a line being drawn on the dirt. Here's a few other pieces. This I think was on the card. Uh, these are actually repurposed skate decks. And a dragonfly. This piece uh, is called Border Borderless. Also repurposed skate decks and also a dialogue about border issues. Uh, bottleneck border. This goes back to kind of what I was discussing earlier about, uh, we're talking about earlier about uh, the reservation, I think being a bottleneck point at, at one point in time for uh, drug runners and, uh, and or other activities. And it just felt like, you know, our people were kind of caught in the middle. And uh, so I kind of created this as a compass to be representative of a compass with the east, the north, west, and the south. And if you notice in this piece, the, uh, the, uh, the west, the east, and the south point to the center. And the north one points upwards towards the north because to me, it made me think of those people uh, trying to come here for a better life, you know? This piece is uh, called Tribal Territory, 2019. This is canvas. This one also has a little compass thing happening here uh, with these uh, 
this style of typography, these block letters are very uh, uh, similar to what you might see. And uh, from my experience growing up in, in gang neighborhoods, you know, that's some, so something you would see on the walls. But what I was thinking about in this is the 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 way we are as human beings and, and the tribalism that we have and the uh, conflict that we have with one another. Um, I don't think uh, I need to tell you uh, too much more about that. I mean, I think we've, there's been clear conflict and division uh, in this country for the last four years, but also I think for the last 400 years and longer uh, as indigenous people know. And just people in general, man, we're unfortunately human beings that are very tribal for better or for worse sometimes, you know? This piece is a acrylic on canvas, Superstition God. There's a lot of crazy detail on this. I love this piece, I love seeing it. I'm glad it's up so other people can see it and it's not collecting dust in my closet or something. These are from a, uh, some vinyl series. These are actually vinyl records. Next to some baskets. Some more vinyl. I love vinyl because uh, just growing up inspired by hip hop music and uh, having you know, my own cousin who is a hip hop DJ and just back in the day when vinyl was still, and I guess vinyl sort of made a comeback, but when people would use vinyl, uh, this is in the middle of the room. This is, a, these are uh, two cellos and four violas or violin. I'm not sure how to tell violins and violas apart. I want to say violas are smaller. And this piece is uh, called Sweet for the Akimer or Sweet for the River. It was uh, an interesting moment. A couple of years ago, my friend Dwayne and I were working on a piece and we were working, working literally right next to the dry riverbed on the reservation. And it was probably February and uh, the snow must have melted and, and, and we had crazy rainstorms and the uh, the dam had let water out and it was just super full of water. And it was great to see that the power of that river that used to flow through the valley, you know, that's very important to, I don't think that's something I touched on earlier. That's was extremely important to us and uh, still is. I mean, really, you think about it, water is still the most important element in this crazy environment that we live in here in Phoenix. You know, like uh, what happens if one day when the water runs out, what are we gonna do? And that, I think, is pretty much the show. If you come in here, you can see a little bit of a slideshow happening with some other pieces that uh, I didn't include. Uh, a couple of quotes on the walls, one by John Coltrane. I love that, that quote. I never even thought about whether or not they understood what I'm doing. The emotional reaction is all that matters. As long as there's some feeling of communication, it isn't necessary that it be understood, John Coltrane. And that is the exhibit. And I think I'll stop with the uh, conversation there. So if we have any questions or Shannon, if you want to add anything. Yeah, well, if anybody has a question, you can enter it now in the chat. Um, not, none have come in so far. I had, um, I did uh, have a couple, but you might have answered it. I, I, I was going to ask if you had a favorite piece, but the, but you said the canvas piece that you really enjoyed that you're glad that it's up. I, I don't want to assume. Is that your favorite piece in the? Oh, uh, I in mean, the, I, have, I, love them. <laughs> I love them for all different reasons. I mean, the canvas piece that I was showing, uh, it's just uh, uh, something, a different composition that I haven't really worked on again. And I, probably should, but uh, as artists can be crazy backed up with ideas, sometimes it's just a matter of trying to get to it. It could take, who knows, months, years, but hopefully not. 
But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love all these pieces for different reasons, so. Um, and then the only other question that I wrote down for you is how do you feel like creating art is a form of persistence and resistance in your life? Because you had that great persist uh, graphic that you showed us. So how do you see like that form of persistence and resistance um, through your artwork? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? I was quickly distracted because I was looking for my phone. I caught part of that. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no. Um, I said, so how do you feel like creating art is a form of persistence and resistance in your life? Yeah, I mean, I just feel, I feel like being who I am in general is a form of persistence and, and resistance. Being here and alive when when our our people, my people, you shouldn't even be here. You know, we were cl clearly uh, there was attempts of genocide on, on the indigenous people of the lands here and uh, it happened in different forms in different ways. You know, we, I think uh, here at the Otham here, we didn't get the same treatment that happened earlier in earlier years, like on the East Coast where people died of disease and, and, uh, and or just gunned down uh, in, in whatever kind of battles or wars. Here, the, uh, our greatest resource was taken from us, the water and our ability to be self-sustainable uh, and grow crops and our natural diets and things like that. But I feel, I understand that and I feel that and it's motivating for me. And I guess also for my own experience, again, being involved with uh, graffiti and knowing where that comes from, a similar place, you know, creating something out of nothing and born out of, out of uh, necessity and, and survival, uh, self-sustaining uh, physically and mentally. And I really, uh, I really uh, have that, that deeper connection deep down that, uh, you know, I know this is something that I'll do forever, as long as I can, as long as I'm able to, uh, whether it's small works of art or large scale works of art, uh, it's extremely, extremely important for me. And, uh, and I reckon, again, I recognize that in other people too, in, in other art forms and movements and things like that. So anyways, I, I hope that answers that, that question. No, it does. <laughs> it was great. There's, there's a couple of questions that have come in. And so I know sure. that we want to be respectful of everybody's time, but I'll just pose the questions to you and then maybe you can choose the one that you would like to close with. Sure. Um, so someone asked, uh, do you have a larger series of skate deck pieces? Um, somebody asked if you could explain the symbolism in the Arizona state outline image that you shared last. And then the last question that we had come in was your art has evolved a great deal over your life, which period still motivates you? Yeah, those are all, all great questions. And I, I think I can answer them all fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, the skate, the skate deck pieces, I, I think I've done individual pieces in the past where it's just one skate deck, but as far as larger series or it's multiple decks, I think these are the only three that I have and I'm, so I'm missing one, but these are the only three where it's multiple decks. Uh, and I think it's pretty cool that it's up in, uh, up in, in, in this museum, in this show right now. And uh, along with a lot of these other, a lot of these other pieces that are repurposed uh, art on found objects type of thing. And then um, the, uh, the Arizona State uh, outline that I had created that I showed earlier, uh, digital creation, the um, piece is, uh, let's see if I can even think about it without pulling it up. Uh, it, it has three baskets on the left side that represent the, the autumn. And you know, I know that there's more indigenous cultures here than that, but it, it, to me, it was relating back to what I was saying about the name origin. And I really wanted to have that represented uh, along with some uh, basketry, as well as my online work uh, and also some of the uh, 
the waves that are in there, the water waves in the blue and, and classic like Arizona colors, you know, Arizona sunset colors anyway. I think that's uh, anybody that's lived in, in the desert here understands and appreciates those Arizona sunsets. Um, and then uh, uh, what was that last question? Something about years of painting or something? I'm sorry. Yeah, so no, it's okay. The last question was your art has evolved a great deal over your life. So which period still motivates you? I really feel like uh, the years painting, uh, you know, in the streets. I mean, I love painting and experimenting in studio and working on sculptural objects, found objects, canvas. But there's something about painting large scale, and I think that's why I still paint quote unquote public art and large scale paintings and murals. But the the era of me experiencing experiencing that and growing up and and even the good even the bad the good and the bad everything that that molded me and my peers that turned us into who we are today fast forward you know 20 30 years later uh it i think it has to do with the man just as simple as endorphins and adrenaline you you, f you feel alive when you're when you're painting you know a freight car in the middle of the night or you're painting a warehouse wall and you're putting up your name and you're you're on this you're on this mission to create and you're going to do it at all costs and you're going to yell at the top of your lungs through that work and through that art and typography you know to me i think that still motivates me it felt like it was like it was uh something that really lit the fire and 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 maybe some ways, uh, uh, it, like, like uh, we're trying to find that again, you know, painting walls and painting murals and public projects, public art projects in a safer environment, in a safer way, I think, a lot more toned down. I mean, I'm 41. I don't, I'm not trying to jump walls and fences and run from cops right now, man. I, I had my share of that. So I'm not trying to have Phoenix PD put a gun in my face because I've had that happen. But um yeah, I, I think somewhere the, there's gratification and satisfaction in painting a large, large mural, but I think somewhere in our genetic memory, we're wanting to have that feeling again. Uh, maybe this isn't the, the greatest comparison, but it's almost like, like man, you, you, you experienced this, this, this drug of adrenaline back in the day, and now you're trying to find that again somewhere, uh, as unfortunately, uh, or whatever, I don't even want to say unfortunately, but as mind altering states can do to a person you know you want to find that that euphoric state again and i think the graffiti world really really helped shape me in that way so yeah thanks for that question whoever asked that well um i just want to say thank you to everybody that has come and attended tonight and if you already don't you should definitely follow free on his social media channel channels and we'll post them on our instagram and social media accounts as well um, thank you for everybody participating and thank you, Breeze, for your excellent presentation. We appreciate you so much sharing your art and your story with us. Yeah, thank you. It's invaluable to have your, your meaning. And so everybody that hasn't seen his show live, I know you got a, a sneak peek of what it looks like with nobody in the galleries, but it's going to be up until March 31st at our Tempe location. So make sure you get in and see it in person because it, it, you, you get so much more when you get to see those colors up close. So right thank you everybody. Have a great night and we'll, we'll see you for our next virtual event. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming. Stay safe. Peace.